Good afternoon to everyone on the East Coast. And good morning to those of you in Hawaii who have <laughs> woken up at this early hour to join us. Some of you are probably calling in from, uh, from home. We appreciate you coming along. And I'm uh, presenting from the new uh, home of NAI. You may see some boxes behind us. It's because we're, we're, uh, we're getting up and running, and, and Mark was doing a great job of, of moving all the technical connections over to this new site. And it uh, looks, like, looks like it's working. Keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> so welcome to the first FAR seminar in a while. I'm very glad that we have 12 sites connecting today. And uh, this is a, a kickoff of of kind of rebuilding the student and, and postdoctoral community and we'll be doing some other activities along with the FAR seminars which you'll get some emails from me about and I'm going to turn it over to Carl Pilcher who will be doing the introductions for today's FAR seminar. Carl? Well hello everybody as uh, Estelle said good morning good afternoon depending upon where you are or a good really really early morning for Hawaii. Um, when I became director of the NAI about a year ago, one of my first questions is, why did we ever stop the FAR seminar? Because it always struck me that this was really a great thing to do. I'm really, really glad that we're doing it again. I want to thank Estelle for helping us get organized, but I want to look at everybody who's uh, participating today and point at all of you and say, I really would like you all to take ownership of this and to really do the organization, identify the speakers, and keep this all going and provide the energy for this. I think that one of the great strengths of the Institute and of astrobiology in general are the young researchers that are attracted into the field. And so graduate students and postdocs, I think, are the real strengths of astrobiology. And I would just ask you to apply some of your energy to this and let's keep this going and make it a really active, vital seminar series. So I really, really appreciate Elise and Evgenia volunteering to lead this off. So we will hear uh, first from Elise Ferlin, who got her PhD at Cornell University. We're going to be hearing from her about first steps of planet formation and protoplanetary disks. And then we'll hear from Evgenia Shkolnik on the on-off nature of star-planet interactions, a probe of magnetized exoplanets. And Elise, take it away. OK, thank you. So uh, my talk today, as you introduced, will be about the first steps of planet formation and protoplanetary disks. And this first slide has a, a pretty background. It's a Spitzer image of the Orion star forming region, which forms massive stars. So here's a brief outline of my talk. I'll first give a brief overview of star formation, disk structure, disk clearing. Then uh, I will show you disk evolution at around an early age of one to two million years in the Taurus star forming region. Uh, grain growth and settling, transition disks, uh, gap formation, and then give you my conclusions. So just an introduction, star formation, what are the main steps? So the earliest stage is the class zero stage up here, where a young star is surrounded by a massive envelope of dust and gas that's infalling onto the central forming star. And uh, if you look at the spectral energy distribution, that's a plot of lambda f lambda, so f lambda is a flux density versus wavelength. It usually peaks at very long wavelengths by infrared sub millimeter, and at shorter wavelengths, you will usually see almost nothing or very faint. And like you can see here, an image is taken from the ground in the optical through the dark spot because it's so extinct. Well, if you go to the mid infrared, like IREC, Spitzer images, IREC and MIPS, uh, there's a core here. Uh, uh, the next stage is the class one stage, after this brief class zero stage, where the object is still surrounded by a large envelope that's falling in, um, and uh, it starts becoming more visible, detectable, mid-infrared wavelengths and also the near-infrared. And uh, the envelope material falls onto the central object that's surrounded by a disk, and then is accreted by this star in the middle. And uh, after about 100,000 years, this stage is over when we have a class two object, also known as Titori star. And uh, there the envelope is mostly dispersed. And um, the object is surrounded by a protoplanetary circumstellar disk. And this is the stage where we think planets form out of this disk that's called a protoplanetary uh, disk that's accreting onto the central star. And over time, millions of years, this disk get dissipated as well. And then um, we are left over eventually with this class three stage where the object is not surrounded by any material anymore, and it's slowly contracting, and once it's not in the core, we talk about a main sequence star. So as I mentioned, the 
an earlier planet form in this protoplanet. This Corona main sequence stars and the two sort of main, I wouldn't even say even conflicting, but two scenarios. One is the core accretion here on the left, and one is the disk gravitation instability on the right. And the core accretion is just this typical scenario where we think grains stick, collide, grow, and form larger particles. The larger particles settle down to the disk midplane, where it's denser, cooler, and they start colli colliding more and coagulating and forming larger and larger bodies. Uh, finally, we form these protoplanets that have a diameter of about 1,000 kilometers. And once they're big enough, they can start creating gaps and sweep up the gas um, in, the, in the surroundings. And that's how we think giant planets form in this core accretion scenario. While these gravitational stabilities, well, it requires massive disks, usually about a tenth of the mass of the star. So here you can see it's about um, about a tenth of a solar mass for a solar mass star. And uh, when a disk is massive enough, we can have formation of fragments. And that can form giant planets on a very rapid time scale. So about less than a thousand years, maybe a few hundred years. And there's also this relatively new hybrid scenario where we still have a massive disk forming gravitational instabilities, but then we can have core accretion going on by concentrating particles in these higher density regions. So it's a gravitational stability, but at the same time, core accretion going on and grain growth. When we talk about protoplanetary disk and disk structure, um, one thing, again, here is this SED plot, nu f nu versus lambda. And uh, one thing to keep in mind that later on I'll show you mid-infrared spectra in the wavelengths range from um, about uh, 4 to 30 microns, so 0.1 to 10 U, it samples the inner disk. And what we're sampling in the mid-infrared is just the upper disk layer here. So it's usually just this uh, heated upper layer that can be seen also here on the right top side up here, um, where it's this hot surface layer that's heated by the star and emits this optically thin emission that we can see here in this little buff here, it's a silicate emission feature, 10 micron and 20 micron. And we also sample this kind of upper layer of the so-called mid-plane of the optically thick part. So we just sample sort of the upper layers here in this. Uh, in the mid-infrared. And what I will not go into this talk, like to see down here, it says gas structure. That would be a totally different topic. Or in a way, they are related. But here, I'll concentrate on the dust structure. So as far as disk evolution goes, we know from observations, both from the ground, so JHK, let's ground-based measurements in the infrared from about 1 to 3 micron, and then this IRAC MIPS that's from the Spitzer uh, Space Telescope, 3 to 8 micron, 24 micron, that this fraction decreases with age. So at about like 1 million years or less, we have about 80, 90% disk fraction. And then it really goes down with age kind of rapidly. 5 million years, just a few, maybe 10%, 20%. And then if you go to older and older uh, systems, about 10 million years, there's basically no more disk left. So disk survive for about 10 million years is a kind of a larger dispersion. So that's the time we have to form planets. And when looking at the median SED, median spectral energy distribution, so just taking a star from region that has a lot of young stars, taking the median of those and uh, normalizing them at some uh, wavelength, uh, we can see here on this dash line here, 1 million years old, we have an axis at 8 micron, 24 micron. And then when we go over to a region, for example, at 4 million years, the decrease is kind of sharp at 8 micron. And uh, at 8 million years, the decrease is much more pronounced at shorter wavelengths than at longer wavelengths. So that points towards evolution of the disk from inside out. So whatever happens in the disk and dissipates it, it evolves or the processes uh, are faster in the inner disk and then eventually the whole disk. What causes this disk clearing? Well, one standard, there is four main processes and there's a combination of those. I don't say that they're exclusive, but these are the main processes we have in mind, accretion under the star, grain growth and settling, plant formation and photo evaporation. I will briefly talk about those four here. So you have in mind what are the processes that cause this clearing. And uh, accretion, well, material gets accreted onto the star, on those magnetospheric accretion columns. And over time, it just decreases. There's a large scatter. We see like this mass accretion rate versus age. There's a large scatter at each individual age. But overall in time, at least when we go to 10 million years and older, it's really decreased. There's less and less material available to be accreted. Then with grain growth and settling, well, like I mentioned earlier too, that with this core accretion scenario, we think that grains start sticking, growing, forming larger bodies, and then settle down to the disk midplane. And the disk 
the, this, the grain growth in this is thought to be faster in the inner disk and also faster for larger grains. Larger grains, of course, they're heavier, they settle faster. And then um, it's also faster in the disk. We have higher densities and higher orbital speed. So I think it's more sticking and growing happening. And what happens here with, again, this SED, lambda f lambda, or nu f nu versus lambda plot, um, with simulations over time, starting the simulation, we have this excess 10 micron and uh, excess mid infrared. And then over time, it just decreases and comes lower and lower, uh, just because the grain grows start, the grains grow and settle, and the disk becomes less and less flared, like in this uh, view here. So the disk is less flared and then emits less in the mid infrared. And then planet formation of these scenarios, core creation, disk computation stabilities, and once a major, larger planet forms, it starts clearing out a gap in the disk. And uh, what happens is then that the disk inside of that gap is being uh, accreted onto the star. So we create an inner disk hole. So if you see a disk with a large inner disk hole, you might think, well, maybe a planet formed in there and uh, caused, therefore, the inner disk to be accreted and sort of prevents the material from outside to come in and get accreted. Does that set a particular scale? Scale? Well, yes. The, the snow line, presumably you can't have too small a planet disk. Because if you're going to form plants quickly, they have to at least, the disk has to extend out to a few AU, the hole. So if you had a hole of, sort of half an AU, that's probably not easily explained by. Except action. for the gravitational instability, for example, if the conditions are right. But even but that phases even further. Yeah, because you yeah, need higher density, but yeah. At low orbital speeds, but it's a tumor Q parameter. It says when the disk is unstable, and yeah, yeah. But then you also have planet migration at the same time, so the whole picture is a little bit muddied by that too. So it's not as easy as I explain. Usually, like we try to figure out things, but there are obviously complications too. And uh, again, I said the disk hole might be a planet, but then it's sort of a natural way to produce an inner disk hole, and that's sort of operation. And that's just because a young star is known to emit UV and X-rays, and they start heating the upper layer of the disk, kind of a little biograph down here. And um, what happens is that the UV photons, and probably X-rays, but mostly UV photons, ionize the gas. So the gas is a hot temperature, has a high thermal speed. And if at a certain radius, that thermal speed is higher than the escape velocity at that distance, the gas is blown away. This is photoevaporative flow. It started at a certain radius, so this is sort of a simulation with sigma, that's the surface density, versus radius. And at the start, it's, okay, it's usually decreasing with radius. And then when the simulation is run, uh, once this photoevaporation sets in, the disk is cleared out in the inner part much quicker than the outer part, because starting at this radius here, apparently the simulation 1 AU, the uh, dust and gas is blown away, and then the inner disk accretes, and then eventually the outer disk is very quickly eroded too. So that causes quick disappearance of the disk, but from the inside out. So what do we observe now? So I focus mainly on Taurus. That's a star forming region that's about 140 parsecs away. It's nearby, about 1 to 2 million years old, has low extinction, which is good. So we can really see a lot of the young stars there and not obscured by dust. And it has uh, it's more isolated star formations, so not really in a lot of big clumps. And it forms low mass stars, so less than about um, two solar masses. And this is just sort of a sample. It's kind of hard to see, but you're not supposed to look at all the detailed names. It's just to show you a sample of IRS spectra. This is Spitz IRS, an instrument that takes spectra from 5 to 36 micron down here of Titorian stars. We observe Titorian stars in Taurus. And it's just a large diversity of spectra. And some of them have this very strong well, 10 micron and 20 micron silicate emission feature. And then overall, we can see how does the SED change from 5 micron to the longest wavelength, about 40 micron. And there's quite a diversity of objects, which I will explain why. So one thing we started looking into is dust growth in those disks. And like I mentioned earlier, this 10 and 20 micron feature, they kind of tell us something about grain growth, the sizes of grains. When we have, this is just a model, grains are astronomical silicates. And uh, when we look at small sizes, 0.11 micron, we see a nice peak, strong peakish-shaped feature at 10 micron and at 20 micron. But then when the grains grow, like 2.5, 6 micron, we see that this feature gets sort of washed out. They become much less pronounced and much wider, up to the 6 micron. And probably around 6 to 10 micron, the feature is totally washed out. We don't see any more emission feature. And what we did is to fit about 70 Tauri star spectra uh, with um, actually opacities derived from the lab. 
And what we found is that um, in the inner disk, which is about a few tenths of a U, relatively warm, the typical mass fraction of large grains is about 50%. And when we talk about large grains here, it's about 5 microns. So, so about 50%, uh, again, here is this number versus warm, large, warm, warm large grain mass fraction, about 40, 50, 60%. While in the outer disk, and that's characterized by cooler temperatures, a few of you, the mass fraction is actually much smaller. So about like, most disks have only about a 10% mass fraction of cold large grains. And there are a few objects though that have 100% of uh, cold large grains there. So it's a large variety between systems. So it's not that we can say, yeah, there's a really uh, continued evolution towards large grains, but already indicating in the inner disk where we think processes occur faster, the grains apparently are growing. Can you tell the difference between refractory grains and ices? Uh, yeah, because these are all, because ices have also characteristic features, but some grains might have some ice coating on them, yes. Because that would be something that would be interesting to see, see the difference, like 5 5 you'd expect a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, but in this case, it's just fitting the same five micron amorphous, uh, five, mi five micron porous amorphous grain. Uh, but you can't tell whether those are, have or do not have ice. No, but with these fits, we already get good fits just having that component. If there's an extra ice component, maybe it might improve the fit a little bit. But already with this five micron grain, you can see there are larger grains. But you cannot, yeah, we cannot exclude there might be some other components in those fits, but I'm supposedly minor because we already get good fits just with those five micron. And again, we sample the disk, the higher layers anyway, too. So the ice is more in the inner plane. And the next thing I, we looked at is like uh, dust settling, because as I mentioned earlier, dust growth is supposedly accompanied by dust settling. And these are just a few model plots that are kind of visible here. Um, so different models of accretion disks. And uh, this epsilon parameter here is like the purple line is kind of poorly thin, blue line and yellow line. and red line, these are different settling in the upper disk layer. So for example, this epsilon 0.1 means there's a 10% depletion of small grains in the upper disk atmosphere due to grains growth and settling. And again here, this, the mid infrared axis decreases sharply with settling. And what we did then is to take all 85 class 2 objects in Taurus stars in Taurus and compute the spectral indices. So again, this lambda lambda versus lambda plot looking at the slope between 6 and 13 micron, and then between 13 and 25 micron, which is supposedly characteristic of the continuum of the optically thick part. So not this optically thin layer, but more the optically thick layer that's just underneath the disk atmosphere. So more a level of how much has the disk settled. So if it's more flat than flare. And this th 13 to 25 micron versus the 6 to 13 micron spectral index, or so just the slope, those open diamonds are the data points, and those colored dots here are the models. So models with different inclination angles. So down here you can see that key is uh, different inclination from 75 to 11 uh, degrees. And the size of those dots represent different depletion factors of dust in the upper layer. So the large dots, this 0 0.001, is a 0.1% depletion or a factor of 1,000 depletion So 1,000 times less small dust grains in the upper layer than the standard mixture that we assume. And it's not a perfect match, but most data points definitely agree more with the larger dots and not with the small ones that are kind of up here. So that's already an indication that in Taurus, at one to two million years, we have dust settling of kind of factors 100 to 1,000 in the upper layers. So indication that is dust settling going on in those um, this and most likely grain growth, and combining that with the previous result to then correlate the warm, warm large grain mass fraction with this spectral index, this from 13 to 31 microns, so the longer wavelength spectral index. It's a bit of a scatter plot, and if you just compute the correlation coefficient, it's sort of a very, very weak correlation that you have a trend of greater warm large grain mass fraction with more settling or negative spectral index. So it shows this kind of correlated the dust settling and the dust growth as expected too, but it's already this one to two million years. But this large dispersion definitely has to be taken into account and that definitely shows that there might be a, like a continuous dust processing which is dust growth settling and that's it. There might be some radial mixing, some turbulence, this is magneto-rotational instabilities, 
taking place. And maybe even planet forming larger bodies, it might totally sweep up the inner region and uh, then it gets probably replenished with smaller grains. So there might be a lot of processes going on. So they're very dynamic systems. So it's not just a linear evolution from small grains to large grains. And going back to the index, two spectral index plot, so the long wavelength 13 to 25 micron versus the 6 to 13 micron index um, is kind of a larger scale here. And there are certain outliers up there that I would like to point out to you that have a 6 to 13 micron, so the shorter wavelength index, roughly comparable to the bulk of T Tauri stars here. But their 13 to 25 micron index, so the longer wavelength side, is much steeper. So they have this kind of steep rise. and Hope you can see that too, that between so basically around 13 to 25 micron longer wavelength, this is steep rise. And what we call these objects are transition disks that have cleared out inner disks. So in this plot, this dashed line represents the photosphere, and then those curves here are the different uh, RS spectra. And especially Kokuta 4, DM Tau have basically photospheric emission at the shortest wavelength, and then they really take off at the longer wavelength, which shows us most likely that we have an inner disk hole and there's still an outer disk that's remaining. And some kind of individual differences here, as you can already see, Jim Araija has some kind of axis above the photosphere at the shortest wavelength, so it has some material most likely in the inner disk, while Kokuta 4 and DM Tau lie almost perfectly on the photosphere, so it's really clear out the inner disk. And one of them is accreting like DM Tau and one isn't, so there's some differences there too. I'll point out later. So this is a schematic here, um, that is a science center of how we interpret, again, these transition disks. So when we have a star with no disk in a logarithmic plot, brightness versus wavelength, or nu f nu versus wavelength, sort of a straight line, rally gene stale. Then when we have a star with a full disk, it has this emission, 10 micro emission, 20 micro emission, and just a lot of excess in the infrared. While if we have these transition disks, uh, they have this photospheric emission, shorter wavelength, just because there's no material, there's a hole in there, and then access it along with wavelengths. And what we did is compute models for these objects. Kukuta 4, GMRI, GDM Tau, and Bernard, there are a couple others that have been modeled in detail. And there's some differences, like uh, Kukuta 4 doesn't have accretion going on, while DM Tau and GMRI, they do have gas accretion onto the star. So even though DM Tau, like you see up here, has photospheric emissions, so apparently no dust grains in the inner disk, there is likely some gas still streaming in and accreting onto the star. And uh, Kukuta 4 has a negligible outer disk, so probably it's a very tiny ring of material, but both DM Tau and GMRI, they do have outer disks. So that can give us clues about what caused these inner disk holes, what is happening in those disks. And it is a little flow chart. Oops, it is on top there. Well, uh, this little flow chart to um, uh, show what can we, what clues can be used to interpret those transition disks. And um, one thing is, if we see a smaller infrared access and a wider 10 micron feature, then that's definitely for sure an indication for grain growth and settling. And models and both observations, they tell us that happens on a time scale of less than a million years. So that's expected, and we observe that, and that's a definite clue. Then if we see it in a disk gap with depletion of dust and gas in a disk, if at the same time we have a remnant outer disk, then we can form planets, and just if the outer disk has still a lot of gas left over, we can form a gas giant. If there's not much gas, then we've just formed terrestrial planets. And um, if you think about core accretion, it probably takes 10, 20, 30 million years. But as long as there's an outer disk there, we have hope for plant formation. Well, if there's a vanishing outer disk, so very little, like in Kuku Tau 4's case, we have almost no outer disk left over. If there's still mass accretion left over, so we have accretion from in the inner disk hole, probably with gas, um, we could still have planets forming. But yeah, so there's still material out there that uh, can form planets, but most likely maybe only terrestrial because there's not that much material left there. But if at the same time we have very low mass accretion, then one interpretation is photoevaporation. So these are not really exclusive formation scenarios. It's just so more or less what to keep in mind, that photoevaporation really requires you to have a very small outer disk and also very low mass accretion just so that the disk can be blown away. Otherwise, if you have mass accretion, then the photoevaporative flow will have no influence on the disk. And finally, no matter what you see in terms of the micron feature or in terms of um, in terms of uh, depletion of the inner disk, uh, the, if you have a massive outer disk, then we can form planets uh, by gravitational stabilities. 
And yeah, in the last few minutes of my talk, I uh, will show you some very new results on the, um, also again to identify the disk evolution in protoplanetary disk. And one is to look at the degree of dust settling, so again the spectral index between 13 and 31 micron, and the uh, equivalent width of the 10 micron feature up here. So that's basically the spectral index on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the strength of this 10 micron feature here. And just in this box, here's the results for models, where there's a certain spread in one direction due to up here we find more flare disks, down here we find more saddle disks, and this other spread is due to different stellar parameters, like core disk parameter accretion and inclination angle. And what we did is then to look at what the objects one to two million years, like Ophiuchus, Taurus, Chameleon, of, and Ophiuchus off core, the slightly different ages, and just to have again this plot of the spectral index versus equivalent width. And well, for example, Taurus, we have a lot of objects in this box, which is expected for full protoplanetary disks. There are some outliers on the right hand side. Chameleon, there are even more. And Ophiuchus off core, even though you have like very small number statistics, there are a lot of objects out here. And um, what what are these objects? They have spectral indices, 13 to 20, 31 micron, that are roughly the same as typical full accretion disks, but they have this 10 micron feature that is really, really strong. And when we interpret that, I did this little sketch, this is sort of a disk around a star, and if we have a full disk, so never mind this kind of ring in here, it's for example like this DD tau, where we just have the micron feature and a certain slope of the ICD. Well, if we start forming a gap with some optically thin material, then the 10 micron feature is expected to be stronger than just a normal full disk, just because we have this extra optical thin material that emits, especially at 10 and then at 20 micron. So that's how we start interpreting these outliers in those diagrams. There might be objects just forming disk gaps. So, so I'll probably give you quickly my conclusions. So first of all, we know that this dissipation is about 10 million years. It goes from the inside out relatively fast. Grain growth and settling is observed at uh, about 1 million years old, in, at an age of about 1 million years in the Taurus Starfrom region. Transition disks seem to be very interesting to understand all this process of disk clearing from grain growth for the evaporation planet formation. And this last plot I showed you with the median fret spectral index versus the equivalent width of the temacron feature, so the strength of the temacron feature, might indicate the opening of gaps in some of those objects. And at this age of 1 million years, when we're talking about first steps of planet formation, well, when we see grain growth and settling, that could really be the early steps of core accretion. Again, it might not be a linear process, but at least we start having those larger grains that are required for the core accretion process. And if we see inner gaps and holes, like really fully cleared out regions, it might really point that planets formed already by gravitational instabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. And we just have a few minutes for questions. I'd like to ask everyone to raise your hand in WebEx if you have a question so we can uh, make it go smoothly. And uh, let's see. Don't see any hands raised. Yeah, I think, were there some questions here? Mm -hmm. okay. And any questions? I'll just open it up to the floor. Elise, can we, can we do it verbally from here? If you speak loudly. Um, uh, Elise, can you tell us why um, you have s there are some stars with um, rapid rates of gas accretion that seem to have very little dust associated with the gas, and then other stars with comparable amounts of gas accretion where there seems to be maybe lots of dust, a full complement of warm dust? Why, why is there this seemingly dramatic difference between rapidly accreting stars with and without dust? Could be effect of grain growth because once the grains are really large, they sort of decouple from the gas, and they don't follow the gas motion anymore. So that could be one thing. But um, yeah, usually with the photo evaporation, for example, that when the grains are really small, they get blown out with the gas at the same time. But once um, the grains have grown, then it just affects the gas and the dust remains behind. So yeah. Then there's also the story about binaries and so on, who knows, that, that might influence things too. Could be grain growth that way. Any other questions from any sites? Okay. Here. Thank you, Elise. And I'm going to turn the floor back over to Carl, who will introduce our next presenter. Okay, I also realized I did a bad job of introducing the uh, presenter who just spoke. I didn't mention where she was from, and she was speaking to us from UCLA, of course, as a member of the UCLA team. 
And our next speaker is Evgenia Skolnik, who is speaking to us from the Moon Room at the University of Hawaii. I remember that room well. And uh, as I mentioned, she's going to be talking to us about the on-off nature of star-planet interactions, a probe of magnetized exoplanets. Evgenia? I think your mic is muted. Evgenia, you may be muted on your end. Can you unmute your microphone? Hello? I didn't touch it since you and I last okay. spoke. We, uh, we hear you now, so it, it worked itself oh. out. The miracle okay. of modern technology. Go ahead. Thanks. Like, I'm amazed that this is actually working for all of us <laughs> sitting here <laughs> talking. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here on a pile of rabbit's feet and all sorts of, you know, four-leaf clovers with my fingers crossed. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing uh, with my collaborators, Gordon Walker, David Bolander, Pingao Gu, and Martin Kirster for the last five years or so. And we'll be talking about the later stages of kind of the end stage of what Elise was talking about, the actual planets. I'll talk about the planets that um, have been detected and what kind of follow-up research we can be done that can be done with them. So in brief, for those of you who don't follow you know, the news, the emails that we get every week or so about the new planets that are discovered, now there's 217 planets as of last night. I didn't check this morning. Um, but this is a simple plot of them where on the y-axis it's just the names of the stars. So there's so many they're hard to read. And on the x-axis is the orbital um, semi-major axis. And so the stars that I'm going to be talking about are called hot Jupiters. And it's these in inward inside planets that orbit very tightly. Here's just a zoomed in shot of them. Um, and so their general characteristics are that they're about a Jupiter mass and that their distance from the star is less than 0.1 AU, where an AU is the distance between the star, between the sun and the Earth. And their orbital periods are very short, less than 10 days. And the stars in particular that I'll be talking about are actually less than seven days orbital periods. So people have called them roasters, close and giant planets, hot Jupiters, I'll kind of be tossing those around. Um, but needless to say, they're very, very hot and uh, also are only real options for doing a lot of follow-up science for on extrasolar planets right now. And here's just an image to scale, just to give you an idea of how different this is from Jupiter and the Sun. Um, this is HD 179949, a star that I'll be spending most of my time talking about, and it has a massive planet at about uh, one Jupiter mass, orbiting at three days, and a distance of 0 0.05 AU. Now, to put that in context relative to the star, that's only seven stellar radii away. It's very, very close. And compare that with Jupiter, which is at five AU from our sun. Um, and so current observations of hot Jupiters are really amazing. And I think um, it's fascinating what we can learn about hot Jupiters um, in the last five years. Um, so for instance, I'll just run through these quickly. In a transiting system where the planet is actually eclipsing the star, as in this cartoon or this uh, artistic impression here, you can see the absorption through the planet's atmosphere. And so this has been detected. The sodium, um, lime and alpha, this hydrogen, um, oxygen, and carbon absorption has been detected in the atmosphere of the planet around HD 209458, which you've probably heard something about. And so there's, you know, that interpretations about huge mass loss and runaway evaporation because we detect so much more of this than we would expect given the size of the atmosphere of the planet. Um, another interesting thing is the thermal emission that has um, been studied on several planets using the Spitzer Space Telescope. And this is actually measuring temperatures on the day-night side of the planets um, and getting a weather, really a kind of a weather map of these hot Jupiters. Um, a very recent detection by Tinetti et al. has actually shown also with Spitzer that there's water in the atmosphere around the planet um, HD 189733, also a transiting planet. So one thing about these three top ones is that all of these are done with space telescopes. I mean, you really need the high sensitivity, you need the top of the end instruments to be doing all that. And for most of them, the work has to be done with a transiting planet, which is not always the case. There's only about 20 um, 27 actually transiting planets right now known out of the 217. 
So what I'm going to be talking about is star-planet interactions, and this is something that um, we've been doing from the ground using excellent in instruments and top-of-the-line instruments, but ground-based instruments nonetheless. And so the take-home message I'll give you right now about star-planet interactions is that we've detected them. We've detected an actual magnetic interaction between a close and giant planet and its star, and that is our first indirect evidence of planetary magnetic fields outside of our solar system. We've been monitoring it for long enough, for five years, um, where we can actually see it happen and then disappear and then happen again. So I call this the on-off nature of SPY, star planet, and it's, it's, uh, it's going to be all the rage, star planet interaction. So that's what I'm going to be calling it, SPY, um, due to stellar magnetic fields. And lastly, what we want to be doing with this is detecting the magnetic fields is one thing, but also figuring out how we can measure the magnetic field itself, because right now we don't know. We can't tell you if it's the same as Jupiter, which is 4.3 Gauss, or the same as the Earth's magnetic field. We just don't know, but we want to develop a potential probe of these. So naturally, what are the astrobiological implications for magnetic fields? Well, for those of you who do, any, do the planetary science in our solar system, understand very well, probably better than I do, about what magnetic fields do, especially for the Earth and how they protect our atmosphere. So from um, detecting and understanding magnetic fields on extrasolar planets, we can then get magnetic field geometries, for instance, um, the planetary structure, we have definite implications for the internal structure of the planet itself. Um, we also can set constraints on the environment for the planetary atmospheres. Because as you know, the, um, the magnetic field of the Earth protects us from high energy cosmic radiation, um, or high energy particles from the sun, and we need that in order for our atmosphere to exist. Um, also, mass loss, if there were no um, magnetic field, we would have some sort of streaming or photo evaporation of our atmosphere. And there's a, an issue of orbital decay, especially for these hot Jupiters, uh, because, as I'll show you, the energy that is lost is, has to come from somewhere, and it's modeled to come from the orbital energy between the, of the planet. So there's some implications for orbital decay and possibly migration and that sort of thing. My next slide is not going. Ah, there we go. So this, um, we didn't come up with this idea in a vacuum. It was actually first published by Manfred Kunz and Steve Saar and Musialik in 2000, just in time for me when I was looking for graduate uh, theses to work on. And so it worked well. And so they published this idea of maybe the star, the hot Jupiters have a tidal, perhaps, or a magnetic interaction with a star that would induce some sort of observable heating of the outer atmosphere of the star. All right, so if it was a tidal interaction, then you would expect um, that the period of the interaction is um, half that of the orbital period. So you'd see whatever effect happened twice as the planet goes around the star, and this effect drops off as the semi-major axis to the one-third, to the minus three. Um, and if it was a magnetic interaction, you would just see it once. You'd see it as a planet orbits around the star, and so it would have the same, the interaction period would be the same as the orbital period. And again, it drops as 1 over 8 to the minus 2, which is why, of course, hot Jupiters are our best bet at detecting this sort of thing, because it drops off quickly with semi-major axis. Um, and you would have the concentration of the heating at the, what I call, what's called the subplanetary point, and that is the phase where the planet um, and the star are aligned with the observer, with us on Earth. So if it was transiting, it would be at the point of transit. If it's not transiting, it would still, it would just be, you know, as if they were lined up. And here is an image, an actual reconstruction of a binary star system that exhibits this exact same behavior. And of course it's enhanced because we have two stars with two strong magnetic fields interacting, but it is an observable effect. This is an example of ER Vol. And you can see that hot spot as it rotates in and out of view. So the hotspot is always there. The question is, you know, at what phases do we see it? And so when you think about an interaction from the ex outside, so it's not the star itself producing it, it's something external to it, you would expect the interaction to be greater in the corona, which is closer in proximity to the planet itself, um, and in the outer layers, which um, are act which um, you may not have known, but there is a temperature inversion that happens above the photosphere. 
So the sun's photosphere, let's say, is about 6,000 Kelvin, and it actually becomes hotter as you move further, further up in the atmosphere. And the chromosphere is about 10,000, and the corona is quite hot in several million degrees. Now, we, ideally, we would love to look at this, um, um, look at this effect in, in the corona, but you need space telescope time, which is very hard to get, um, and um, especially for the duration, the kind of monitoring programs that we want to do, it's hard to do um, from space. So we devised a program that we can do it, um, look at chromospheric activity indicators from the ground. And so here's an example. Here's the sun in broadband. This is the full visible spectrum. Or, yeah, well, the visible spectrum. And you can see how if you look now in calcium-2, you're now looking into the chromosphere further up. Calcium-2 is um, ionized calcium that is emitted at, um, at about 10,000 Kelvin, so a little higher up. And if you can see the hot spots. It's a little brighter where there's activity, where there's strong concentrations of magnetic activity. And we sort of call them magnetic storms, but you, you, know, you get the idea that there's just more activity going on, which means there's more emission in the calcium too, and that is going to be our primary indicator of stellar activity, looking for this excess heating, possibly induced by the planet. And where do we do this? Well, mostly, um, most of the work I'm going to be showing you is, was done at the 3.6 meter Canada France Hawaii telescope here in Hawaii. Um, it is a collaboration by, by those three agencies and worked out quite well for me because being Canadian, we got, we have 42% of the time there, so I could do my, do get a lot of research done there. And so for those of you who have never been there, it's about five stories high. You can see the little people up front. So it's quite a big structure. And if you're ever in Hawaii, I definitely recommend visiting Mauna Kea and checking out all the infrastructure that astronomy has afforded us. But what it has there, aside from the telescope itself, is an instrument um, that collects the complete optical spectrum of a star. And this is a EPO version of a stellar spectrum. Um, this is just happens to be of the sun, but each of those lines are absorption lines um, in, this, in the atmosphere of the sun. And so if you cut across one of those lines, you get the spectrum um, that we're interested in. This is a spectrum of a star called HD 189733. And even though all these lines that I point out here are very interesting chromospheric lines, they actually probe various heights in the stellar atmosphere, I'm going to only focus on, for simplicity, the calcium 2K line. So in the ultraviolet, it's here at 3,900 um, uh, angstroms. And so you can see how, in this little red box, the strong peak shows that this particular star has a lot of magnetic activity and has a lot of energy being emitted in just this line. And I'm going to zoom in on this box for another star that you'll see does not have the same. This is a much weaker, um, th this star has a much weaker magnetic field in general, but still it has some calcium-2 emission. And you can see this is over, this is a plot that's overlay, overlaying nine different nights of the same star. You can see in these other photospheric absorption lines that there's no activity, whereas right in the chromosphere, you see there's some wobble. It's kind of hard to see. I'll show you a better plot um, next. But what I want to emphasize is that we're looking at something very small, but clearly detectable. Okay, so there's actually increased energy being emitted in calcium-2 in the chromosphere of the star. And it varies from night to night. Um, here's more spectra of the same star taken in different times. The first, um, I guess the left-hand side, is taken from September 2005, where the top is just the overlaying chromospheric um, emission, the calcium-2 absorption. And the second panel is show you the residuals. So it's just taking the difference from the mean. And the bottom is what we call the MAD plot, the mean absolute deviation. It's just a kind of form of saying how much activity is really going on in this star. So you'll see that in, if you compare September 2005, to the right panel, 2006, there's a lot more activity going on in 2005 than in 2006. However, in 2006, there's still a significant amount. It's small, but there's still a significant amount of vari variability going on from night to night. And, um, and when I say from night to night, we usually typically observe for about five or six nights. Um, hopefully, at least three or four will be clear. And, um, and so it's just really from you know, Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, there's a real measurable change. And if you measure the integrated flux of these residuals, um, you get this kind of plot where the y-axis is 
just the amount of energy, the residual energy um, in the calcium-2 emission. And the x-axis is the rotational phase. And remember that phase equals zero is the subplanetary point where the planet is um, in front where the planet is in front of uh, the star relative to us. So what you see here is that over three different observing runs, we see a very nice correlation with a spot model. The black line is a spot model as if there was a spot on the actual star that comes into view and then out of view and then into view as the planet rotates around. And what's, what was a surprise was that, that the peak of it doesn't actually happen at phase equals zero. It happens a little bit sooner. There's actually a phase lead. And that leads us to wonder what's going on, what kind of magnetic structure must there be in order for there to be a phase lead. You might intuitively guess, well, it must be a phase, maybe there should be a phase lag, some sort of time delay, but really it's a phase lead. So this is giving us some other um, indication of what's happening. So here's my little cartoon of the star in chromospheric light emitted, and there's the planet. And so you can see how, oh, sorry. Uh, you can see how the stars, how the star spots track the planet in its orbit, not with the rotation of the star. The rotation of the star is much longer. Um, at this point, before we knew the rotation, I'll get to that in a minute, but all indirect evidence showed that the rotation of the star was longer than nine days, and there wasn't a way to phase these plots with more than, with, with an, well enough with a nine-day period. So it's not just that the rotation of the star is moving these spots around. Now, if you measure the energy output of this kind of, uh, of this spot, it's about 10 to the 27 ergs per second, which happens to be very close to the typical solar flare energy. So we're talking about some, some sort of magnetic activity on the star. And um, given that we've come back several years, the fact that it's lasted for several years is amazing because a normal star spot really only lasts for one or two solar or stellar rotations, so that's just a few months. Um, it also appears to be magnetic because there's one hump in the plot, not two. If it was tidal, you might see some sort of activity happening twice per orbit. Um, and the fact that there's a phase lead indicates some sort of magnetic um, geometry, like a Parker spiral, for instance, where, you, where the, for instance, on the sun, there's some magnetic field lines that are spiraled with its rotation, and so you would have, you would have some sort of energy being dumped ahead of where the planet actually is relative to us. Now, since we first published that work in 2003 and 2005, um, there has been other evidence of star-planet interactions. Um, and here's just a few of them. Most as a space telescope that does very high precision photometry of stars with hot Jupiters, and they've seen Photo photospheric spots on the star that vary with the planet's orbit and not with the stellar rotation, which is what traditionally we would expect. Um, star et al. had also used um, an X-ray telescope, Chandra, to look for phased X-ray emission. And so they have claimed that they see that and that the phasing works with ours, with our calcium-2 emission. Um, and lastly was this, um, this Kashyap et al. work did a statistical study of X-ray emission of stars with hot Jupiters and stars with planets that are further out. And what they show is that there's a three, there's that statistically at least, three times as much X-ray emission from stars than, that have hot Jupiters and stars that don't. So this also indicates that there must be some sort of um, increased stellar activity going on um, on stars with hot Jupiters. So what's really going on? I mean, the models are, there's been about, I'd say almost a dozen papers trying to explain this theoretically. And there seems to be some convergence going on, but still we definitely need more data to give the modelers um, something to keep working with. But the, I'll just go through two of the earlier ones. One was by Ipidal, where they um, modeled this magnetic reconnection type of an event using the Jupiter Io um, Taurus model, where there's these footprints on Jupiter that's induced by Io's motion around, around Jupiter. And it develops this current loop and so on, and so you get these hot spots in high and low latitudes. And so it would all measure, um, uh, model it this way, and they theoretically get the same 10 to the 27 ergs per second that we got observationally. So that was very promising. 
And then Sabine Prusadel, for her PhD thesis, started working on this communication scenario. And we'll try and work through that step by step. So if this were a star rotating, here is a spiraled magnetic field line. And there's the planet. If this were the solar system, such that the distance between the planet and the star was now about 5 AU, the stellar wind at 5 AU um, is much um, faster than the alphane wave velocity, which means that any kind of information you can consider or disturbance of the magnetic field at that distance would be carried away by the stellar wind. As opposed to if it was in a hot Jupiter system, the, and now the distance between the star and the planet, this distance here is now 0 0.05 AU instead of 5 AU, you are within the alphane radius, which is defined as a location in space where the velocity of the stellar wind and the velocity of the alphane waves are equal. Now, if you are within this alphane radius, then you can actually transmit information back onto the star, or energy back onto the star along magnetic field lines. And the, st and the stellar wind is just too slow to take it away. And she calls this the magnetic communication scenario. She's also able to, interestingly enough, reproduce the phase difference that we observe. So the phase being that the maximum activity happens at, at a point 0.83 in phase. So it leads the planet by, zero, by about 60 degrees. Um, and she does this by using this Weber-Davis stellar wind model, where um, it now this phase um, the phase offset, let's say, from the phase equals zero, which is the subplanetary point, um, is a function of the stellar rotation speed, as you would expect, and also the orbital semi-major axis. So once you are outside of a certain region, outside the alphane radius, you cannot get the information or the energy back onto the star. And, uh, but if you are within it, then the further you are away, the larger this phase offset would be. All right, so then we go back to, the so back to the telescope after all this activity's been going on in the modeling, and our effect seems to have disappeared, <laughs> which is a bit nerve-wracking. However, there is, some, there is some variability going on, significant variability, just on a smaller scale. Um, and that was, we first saw that in September 2003. And we also saw that in Upsilon N, which is another hot Jupiter system. Um, where the orbital period is now, uh, I think it's 4.6 days. And in this here, we saw it happen for a few years, and it was actually in the first year where we didn't see very much going on. So, but then we went back, of course, we've been monitoring the system for a few years. We went back in 2005, and for HD 179949, um, again, we saw the same amplitude at almost nearly the exact same phase of activity going on. Uh, but in 2006, I'll just back up for a second. In 2006, we saw the same thing. I don't have them plotted here, but it's kind of a lower, a lower amplitude variability. And so then if we plot them up with a seven-day period, now remember, we, um, we still don't know the rotation period of the star. That is surprisingly difficult to measure. I know it seems like such a basic thing. You know, how can we not know how these stars rotate? But it's, it's really a more complicated measurement than we would expect, than one would expect. Um, so we didn't know what the rotation period was, but here we have from two different epochs, from both 2003 and 2006, um, we can fit them relatively well with a seven-day rotation period. So I think this is the first direct measurement of the rotation of the star. Um, they're offset by phase because there's no reason to believe that they're the same spot, let's just say. So I just have a relative phase here. It's not an absolute phase. But anyway, so what we see now is that star-planet interactions seems to have this on-again, off-again characteristic. And lo and behold, theorists came through for us. And Kramer and Starr put out a paper in 2007 um, that explains this and does a very good job. Um, and so what they've done here, you have at the top, you have they take the actual solar magnetic field um, structure at its various stages in the 11-year stellar activity cycle, solar activity cycle. They do the modeling of the, this magnetic interaction with a close in planet. And what they show is that um, the amplitude um, and whether or not the spy star planet interaction emission, excess emission of calcium 2 is even visible, um, has to do with the magnetic structure of the star. And so this is a whole other you know, piece of the puzzle that we really need 
to model is we need to understand the magnetic field structure. And we've then taken that, um, taken this into an observational test using spectropolar imagery and Zeeman Doppler imaging, um, a technique that we're going to that we are using now um, in order to map magnetic fields of the stars at the same time as measuring these stellar activity indicators. And so as you can see over here, you know, in five consecutive orbits, you know, we hear the green line. It's kind of hard to see, but in the green line um, is the stellar rotation, the modulation of the calcium emission just by stellar rotation, and the black line is the rotation plus any star uh, planet induced. You can see that even from orbit to orbit, it varies. Though it always hovers around phase zero, which is the one, two, three, four marks, but even from orbit to orbit, it could disappear, and especially from season to season, and how it varies when the stellar magnetic field structure um, varies in itself. And so lastly, if we look at the collection of the 13 stars that we saw together, um, the 13 stars that we've been monitoring for a few years, we see this very interesting correlation. Now, I'll quickly explain what it is. On the, white, on the y axis, we have MAD, well, the mean absolute deviation. It's just the integrated flux of this activity. So it's just saying how active is the star on a short term time scale. And on the y axis, I have plotted the mass of the planet divided by the rotation period, which is a value proportional to the planet's magnetic moment. And what's amazing is that even though we only have four points, there seems to be this great correlation that says that the stellar activity appears to correlate with the magnetic moment of the planet. And this is going to, one day, if we, actually, if we can really understand this plot in detail, um, allow us to measure the magnetic fields of these extrasolar planets by observing their host star. And Tau Bu, here, you see it off to the side, is sort of the exception that proves the, the, exception that proves the model. And that is because Tau Bu, the planet and the star, are tidally locked, meaning that the stellar rotation period and the planetary period are the same, and which means that there's no relative velocity. There's no there's no s planet sweeping through magnetic fields. So you have this kind of this depressed um, level of activity than you would expect given the mass of the planet. And so in summary, um, we have detected a magnetic interaction between a planet and its hot between a star and its hot Jupiter. Monitoring for all these years has shown that there's definitely an on and off nature that appears to correlate with the stellar magnetic um, activity and will change over its activity cycles. Um, the correlation between stellar activity and planetary magnetic moment is really what's going to give us our first, um, yet indirect, but first probe of exoplanet magnetic fields. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, and again, if uh, any of the sites have questions, please raise your hand in WebEx, but because I don't see anybody, I'm just going to open up the floor oh. and see. We have one question. Yeah, and, it's one of the points. Okay, can I ask you to repeat their question after they say it? I can't hear it. Is that me? Yep. Okay, uh, great talk. Uh, I have a question about this uh, interaction. Basically, if it's a, the communication model that's working, then uh, does the planet have to have a magnetic field uh, in order to be able to feed back information to the star? <laughs> what about the ionosphere uh, of the planet, such as Venus uh, type of interaction? Will that be able to act as an obstacle and feed the information back to the star? Um, that's a great question because Proust et al. say that they um, they don't need a magnetic field in order to have this interaction. The question then, why Gu, Pingao Gu, and Ip, and um, uh, Maureen Jardine, who has a recent paper, a 2006 paper, they need to invoke a magnetic field to get the energies that we see. So then it becomes um, a matter of what is the energy budget and how do you how do you determine that? So when I showed at the beginning, um, the various part components that we're interested in in the stellar spectrum, trying to sample the various heights, is in order to do to really do a, a measurement of the energy budget for this. So it's not just 10 to the 27 ergs per second. There's more going on. It's only 10 to the 27 ergs per second in calcium. But there's obviously much more going on. I mean, there's the X-ray detections. And so you're right. Proust, Proust says you don't need it to have that kind in that communication scenario. But she can't work out, um, but doesn't work out with the energy. You just need more. 
he did more than what we see. So that then invokes that it has to be a relatively strong magnetic field. So right now, the magnetic field strength that people are um, plugging into the models is Jupiter's, 4.3 Gauss, for, the la for lack of anything better. Um, and it's still still a bit low, like in the sense that I, th but again, we don't have the full, all the numbers yet, but it seems like you need a relatively strong magnetic field on the planet in order to get those kinds of energies to begin with. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question, if there's any sites out there with a question. UCLA, I noticed you were doing some fine camera tuning there. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for attending, and I'm going to turn it over to Carl for some closing remarks. Okay, well, thank you very much, Elise and Evgenia, uh, for two interesting talks. I just wanted to encourage graduate students to participate in this series as well. Um, Evgenia and, and Elise are both postdocs, and both postdocs and graduate students are welcome, but I want the grad students in particular uh, to feel welcome to participate, and any graduate student who was at the recent AbgradCon in Puerto Rico and gave a talk there, I would urge you to plan to give that talk here in uh, one of these FAR seminars. So thank you all for attending, and we'll see you the next time. Thanks, thank everyone. you. See you next month.